Warning, if you are faint of heart or easily offended, this show is not for you. Okay, guys, welcome. This is the Nick Fertucci Show. I am Nick Fertucci. I am here with Daniel Negreanu. Let me just say this before we get started. If you're excited about this show, if you're excited about what we're going to do today and talk about and to hear what Daniel has to say, and in general, if you support this show and you want more shows like this, hit the subscribe button, make sure you hit the like button, and I will and we will continue to bring you this type of content. Uh, let's go. Okay, welcome to the Nick Fertucci Show. I am Nick Fertucci, and believe it or not, I am here with Daniel Negreanu. Negreanu, excuse me. Daniel, what's up? Just chilling, bro. I'm a little bit tired, to be honest with you. I know we talked, maybe we could do it yesterday, but it was after the WPT, five straight days, and yeah. I was like, my brain wasn't working right. Well, so, totally. Shit was going to be a couch today, relax. Shoot well, shit with Mr. Nick Fertucci. I appreciate you doing it. So let's let's get right into it. I, uh, you're you're 48 years old now. Now that's not a big deal, but like you're kid poker. You're no longer kid poker. You're like midlife poker. Says who, bro? <laughs> Listen, Kid Rock is what 85. Yeah, that's still right. And he's still rocking. It's a state of mind. Bro. It is true. It and is true. Like, listen, you know, you ever go on? I don't go on Facebook, but you see friends of mine that were the same age. Yeah. You know, they all look kind of like. Old. <laughs> I still got young vibes. I feel young. Guess how old? Guess how old I am? I'm never gonna get old. I just choose not to. Take a shot at my age. What are you? I, I can't. You know what? I can't see that well. But I don't know. I'm gonna guess you're about 45, 44. 56. State of mind, baby. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Keeping it young. Yeah, I could be your dad. That's right. So. uh I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to tell everyone a little about you. Not that you need any introduction, but I asked you to, to send me um, some stats about you. And you're like, dude, I don't care about that. So I said, all right, I'll do my own stuff here. But it's, I got to tell you, it's, and again, you know, I'm not blowing smoke here, but I want, I want the people, especially, especially the new kids in poker to understand what you've accomplished here. And then we're going to get into some real juicy stuff and I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and and we're going to see where it leads. But let, let, me, let me just blow through it here. Uh, six, and, and if any of this has been wrong, because this was as of 2019, you can update me. Six uh, WSOP bracelets, uh, 45 final tables. That's probably up by now, uh, maybe. Money finishes, 148. Your highest main finish was 11th. Is that true? Two times I did it. Two, two times 11th. Okay. WPT titles, two. Final tables, nine. Cash is 24. Euro tours, final tables five. Uh, it just goes on here. Uh, two, as of 2019, you were the third biggest live money winner behind Justin Bonomo and Bryn Kenny. And WSOP Player of the Year in 2004 and 2013. The only one who's done it twice. And WPT Player of the Year 2004, 2005. You were inducted into the Poker Hall of Fame in 2014. Does that about do it? You know what? All facts. <laughs> All, facts. All facts. Pretty That's damn, true, yeah. pretty damn impressive. So kudos to you, man. Um, so let's get into it here. Uh, let's see here. All right. So I'm just going to ask you some stupid shit, uh, some random questions, and then I want to get into the juicier stuff. Uh, some things that have been going around the poker community. I've heard your take on a lot of the stuff that's going on. Believe it or not. And I can't believe I'm even saying this because we differ in a lot of ways in, in other things we believe in stuff. But uh, you probably are the closest to what I think, believe, and know in a lot of these crazy things that have been going on. I've watched some of your recent interviews. And I'm not an Insta bro. If I didn't agree with you or we were polar opposites, I would totally debate it with you. But um, I'm very impressed by your take on things. But I want the people out there to hear it too. But let's... Let's do some of the nonsense stuff that people like to hear. Um, best, you, I think I know your answer in this, but best cash game player uh, and tournament player and why out there right now or all time. So here's the deal, right? I grew up with a guy who was zoned in, focused, 
did it all, crushed it all. Bobby's room, tournaments, bracelets, online, heads up, you name it. And that's Mr. Phil Ivey. Yeah. Okay? And Phil Ivey, you know, he sort of stepped away from the game for a little bit, was doing some other things, but he's back now. And he had a pretty big year, you see, on the Triton Series. He's coming into the PGT Championship, I think, is the two seed. Um, and when he's on and he's playing his best, uh, he's my he's my number one guy. And I think of poker as more than just one thing, right? It's not just no limit tournaments. It's not just no limit cash. It's everything. And he does it all. And he's been doing it all for a very long time. So until someone knocks him off the hill, he you know I, I still have him as king of the hill. Totally. Yeah, I get it. And let me ask you this question. You've been in poker now for a very long time. I told you about it a minute ago. You've been around for a while. Um, what was the f- most fun or best era in poker since you started? What would you say, for whatever reason, when you had the best time in poker or just directly, what was the funnest era in poker for you? You know, that's a great question because they're so different, right? There's, yeah. I've, I've been around for several different eras. I started in the late 90s. So I remember the days of going to the Binion's Horseshoe, smelling the urine, you know, and like on the sidewalks and the smoke in the... In the short you know in in the low ceilings and just that seedy environment but it felt like poker man like old school poker there was something like unique about the characters too right it wasn't like today you look at the era today and it's like you know a lot of the young guys are like okay i was going to mit i dropped out of college ran 50 bucks up into whatever right these guys are like you know it's whatever they come from you know i was a pool they're pool hustlers this guy was a freaking mercenary you know like you had all these interesting characters but i would say probably the most fun time was the poker boom era because it was like you know people you know people know who some poker players are here and there and poker's got its niche popularity but i'm yeah. telling you in the, in the era of like the mid 2000s the, the money maker era what's that was it the money maker era when he brought uh yeah. poker to yeah. really the masses right after the money maker you know the wpt started espn started there and their stuff and then you had shows like poker after dark and uh you know the big game and stuff like that and as a result like being on NBC, you know, poker players became legit rock stars. Like I'm telling you, like I still get stopped in the hallways and whatever at the Rio or, or you know, but like that, and, and you couldn't walk, you couldn't, you couldn't move. It was like yeah, people were so into it. Celebrities were playing. It was like, it was probably I would say it was the high point of in poker history in terms of like its mainstream appeal. Yeah, no, I get it, and and to that, I, I you kind of answered a little bit, but. But if you want to elaborate, how has poker changed, like, as far as the poker community? How has it changed for the better or worse from that time when poker players, you know, were drinking whiskey, eating cheeseburgers, you know, just saying whatever the fuck they wanted to say. And now they're eating salmon and vegetables and worried about their heart rate and their pulse and they're riding bikes in between sessions. So, you know, what... What is, in your opinion, for the better or worse of poker, how, how do you see it? What's changed for the better? What's changed for the worse? And this this even goes for poker, the poker community, the the fans, just anything you want to put in there. Yeah, no, it's another good question, and I'll, I'll answer it a few ways. But, you know, the first thing, as you were formulating the question, I was thinking in terms of, like, how different, like, community looks. Like, so from that era, it was just one big community Yeah. where, you know, this was it. Now, you have subsets, right? You have different groups. You have people who are like diehard watchers of, you know, the streams, right? Then you have others who, you know, they're on like Poker Go. Then you have the Europeans who play, you know, on, on their tours. You have the online realms. And there's so many different content creators and it comes from left, right, and center. You've got the Rampages, the Brad Owens, the yeah. you know, Jamal Burns. You've got uh, the Mimis and Brad Owens. All these, all these different ways in which people digest now with TikTok. You've got this next gen generation. So it, in one sense, it's great because there's so many opportunities for people to kind of, you know, experience poker in a different way, but it's also impossible to keep up with for someone like me. Like right. I used to know like what's going on in poker, but man, I can't keep up with all, like the, the Twitter drama and all this. Like, I remember I was getting asked when you guys were having your drama, what's yeah. your take? I'm like, buddy, fuck, where do I start? You know? <laughs> do I go to watch 80 hours of footage to figure out what I think about this issue and that? Yeah. So, you know, so it was, it's good that it's happened that way. I think, you know, um, some of the differences that may be on the down, downside is I think, here's my take, okay? You probably will agree with me on this because you'd be surprised. We probably agree on a lot more stuff than you think. Um, I feel as though there is a sort of purity test among the younger generation of being these enlightened, perfect human beings 
who don't say fuck, who are never upset, never angry, and everything is wow, you know, and so like, like like the Instagram world, where everyone's life is great and fabulous, and nobody gets fucking mad or pissed off and breaks shit and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I hate to use the term because it's like inappropriately used in a lot of ways, but like almost as though there's a wokeness in the purity test of like some of them where it's like, what happened to just fucking playing poker? Bro. You know, this God. isn't knitting. This isn't fucking, you know, you know, th- this is poker. Sometimes poker people get fucking pissed off, this and that. Like, I feel as though this idea that poker would be better off if, like, it was, like, golf or, you know, I, it's, poker's more like WWF than it is the PG, PGT or the PGA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I got to tell you, you're right. In, in that lane, we probably could sit down and talk about this for hours and probably be on the same page. Uh, you know, I couldn't agree with you more, man. Uh, as, as, as you know, you know, it's just like, and we'll get to it because I have it here. We'll talk about it in a minute. You know, you know, you knock a chair over because you're actually a, an emotional human being that cares about what you're doing, and you make an accident, knock your chair, and like f- ten influencers and nine billion people are going to attack you about how you're either emotionally stable, you're a sore loser, you know, all this stuff. And it's just crazy. Like, what you know, I think you commented a while back on, God, I can't remember what team it was, where one of the one of the guys up in the booth, like, was slamming his clipboard. Like, I get that. Like, hey, fucking this guy cares about what's going on. He's got passion in it. He's, he's showing who he really is. And everyone goes crazy about how he shouldn't be in that position, how he's unprofessional. And I was right on the line with you like I am a lot of times. And if I'm not, I tell you. But it's just like, what happened? Like, this, this, this society is so soft. They're so soft. Yeah, it's a good, good example, too, right? Because, yeah. like, just this tournament here. I didn't even know, like, so what happened was, you know, I had this hand where, you know, it's 22 million chip, chip pot, yeah. 4 million for first WT, I'm grinding my ass off for five days, I get it in on the turn, the guy needs a king or a 10, king hits, I stand up, <laughs> right, and as I stand up, my chair falls, I, I move back, I don't know there's a photographer, like, right yeah, behind yeah. my neck, you know, yeah. but I, I run into him, I hold him like this, and of course, you know, that's a normal reaction, that's what humans do, like, well, part of the appeal during the era when poker was so popular, was people loved watching people celebrate or feel the agony. Like, why do you think Bill Helmuth is such a popular figure, right? Because he feels it. He, 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 if we go back to this idea where nobody shows emotion, like I swear to you, me and my wife would play this game sometimes on Poker Go. We'll watch like a high roller and I won't show where the cards are who won, right? But just based on the reactions of like the handshake, who won? And you can't find No it, idea. Right? No idea. So, and like, no, no, I mean, and honestly, when guys like Bonho, like, I, threw, I broke a selfie stick in the corner because I was fucking, I had a shitty World Series, couldn't take it. I remember. Much like you see in sports when Tiger Woods breaks a club, guys throw a football helmet I remember. Whatever, and they're passionate about it. I took my selfie stick and I threw it on the ground and I was fucking over it, right? <laughs> yeah. He equates this, no fucking joke, to the idea that that's why women don't play poker and domestic violence. It's like, you can't make this shit up. No. Like, you have to get to a level of crazy town that is so beyond repair that I can't even fathom. Like, it, I mean, how do you take that? How do you take me throwing a selfie? It's like, have you ever watched sports in your life? Like, have you ever seen Serena Williams just like break a tennis racket? No. Like, yeah, that's because I'm this generation engaged, right? has been this generation. Obviously, I'm not proud of it. I don't feel like all oh, good for me. But I was like, I was, just, I was, I fucking lost my shit. That's what happened, you know. Yeah, and, and, and I and I didn't hurt nobody. I just yeah, selfie stick. Who who cares? You know, it's because this generation, I believe, has been just so conditioned with like everyone gets a trophy this it doesn't matter if you win like that's such a bullshit you know like it matters if you win and i really wish like for me the only thing i have you know obviously in poker the only reason i'm known now is because obviously i've played on some streams and then i started my own poker stream and it's the number one poker stream in the world and so i get a lot of attention for that nothing like you your your stats are retarded and well i probably can't say that i'm sure i'll get uh i'll get blasted for using that word but i come from a generation where you say retarded okay so uh you could say it five years ago but that's yeah you cool. can't say anymore but whatever so it's like you know now you know i get all this uh, attention too and i i wish that I could have been starting all this, the stream, even though there was no, we weren't doing that then, but 10 or 15 years ago, because I fit in 
back 20 years ago. I don't fit in now. I don't fit into the thinking of throwing a selfie stick is domestic violence and women won't want to play. And if, you know, the Robbie thing, is, oh, it's because she was a woman. Well, no, it wasn't, you know. And it's like all this stuff. So it's very frustrating to me. And you and I have had just a very few short texts and maybe a call or two uh, uh, about some of this nonsense, especially when I was really in the heat of, of going through, you know, what we have went through with this uh, Jack Forehand. And, um, and I, I don't, like, I don't, what do you think about that? Like, why do you think, in just your opinion, because we're kind of just started talking about this organically, why do you think people do that? What, what is it that somebody sits there? Is it really their ideology that they feel this I'll way? Okay. So that's a, that's a really important point to touch on, too, as you, were, as you were speaking. I was thinking, so this generation, right, it's not their fault, okay? It really isn't, and I'll tell you why. There's a great book called Coggling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt, and it's essentially about parents with great intentions, right, not realizing that they're actually, you know, hurting their children in a way, right? So by hope, by coddling them, by, you know, not allowing them to experience emotional pain or failure and all these sort of things, like you said, everyone gets a trophy, nobody feels any sadness. What you do is you take away those children's opportunity to develop that tough skin when they yeah. can take it, right? So right. what we see since 2012, and there's a couple reasons for this, is a, is a significant rise in suicide amongst teenagers or whatever, yeah. and especially young girls, partly because of social media and because they haven't developed, developed the muscle properly of being able to handle someone on Instagram saying, you're ugly, you're ugly, you're, you're a tramp, you have no breasts, you're, you should, you know, you should die and stuff like that, right? So these kids, because they haven't been conditioned to handle this sort of stuff, they end up feeling it so significantly where it does feel like, you know, like the end of the world. Obviously, we know as you grow, it, it's it's just part of life. But I think part of it is, you know, the culture that we created. And also, there's another key important point too in terms of work ethic or whatever, right? We grew up in a generation where if you wanted to get to the top of a mountain, you climb the mountain like you actually have to take the steps kids today they say i want to be at the top of the mountain and they're like okay well you have to climb it's like no no i just want to be at it i just want to yeah. be on top of the mountain and part of the reason for that is this when you wanted to go get a movie when you were young what did you do you, you get dressed you get in the car you drive over to blockbuster you right for all these dvds right you find a couple movies you check out you rent it for three days you watch the movie then you got to bring it back right that's the process today Click your phone, boom, you got a movie, right? So these kids today, or this generation, they live in a world where they get instant gratification, that they don't have to work hard for, they don't have to get. So so part of it is the world that they create, and I actually feel a lot of empathy for them, yeah. because it's gotta be tough, you know? Um, like, you look at all these young kids, what, what do they wanna be now? They don't wanna be doctors, lawyers, and astronauts, they wanna be YouTubers, or influencers, and right. stuff like that. And it's, it's just different, you know? And that's, uh, that's where we're at with it. Yeah, it's pretty sad. I have uh, I have three daughters, and I have only one left in their teens. The, they're 24, 21, and 18 now. <clears throat> and I've experienced that firsthand watching them grow up and go through this. And, and, and you know, I'm an – listen, I love my girls, and, and, and I'm 24-7 on them. Um, but I raise them to – be different than this generation. Now, I, I haven't always succeeded because they're sucked into this stuff. And especially my my youngest was going through that. Like, And she's, I mean, it, it, people will probably troll me because they think this is whatever. I don't mean it the way it sounds, but my daughters are beautiful. And, and my, my youngest is absolutely beautiful. And she has, I could see the pressure she's under just from what we're talking about. And there's been so many talks I've had with her about the attacks and this and that. And it's just... It's so bizarre to me because, like, you know, I, I, I don't understand what I don't understand. And I do understand the immediate gratification. You know, when I grew up, you know, you, you, you went outside, you rode a bike with no helmet. You just, it was just a different generation. If you played baseball, you had to play and get better to play shortstop and lead off. If you sucked, you played right field for the last two innings. That's just the way it is. There, you, you had to deal with winning and losing and, and building your character and working for something. Again, I'm mirroring exactly what you're saying. So it's not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to say I just said that. You did. But it's, it's so amazing to me because now it's not. It, but what I don't understand, too, and I've said this often, is I've never one time in my life picked up my phone 
and just went after somebody. Like, just even if they had a different ideology than me, which could be a complete 180 or they could be saying the stupidest shit or made a mistake or whatever it is. And I just have never done it. And I and I have I've just found it to be perplexing of what that person gets out of it uh, from doing that. And so I don't know. So it's just I don't know how we got on this subject, but it's it's definitely something that's a, a, I'm passionate about because I wish it was different. And and even in poker, I, I, and, and you may not agree with this, you may, I don't know, but it's just like the poker community seems to want to divide itself. Like, the, you know, the Jack 4 thing happens. Like, okay, good, let's let's deal with it. And, and, and it has to be dealt with and all that. But it's just the weirdest thing. Like, it just seems like everyone's ready to accuse somebody of something, attack them for something, tear them down. And I don't know if that comes from jealousy, boredom, insecurities, or whatever it is. But I really wish that I... I could go through everything I'm going through and created this stream and done all this about 10, 15 years ago because it just seemed like it would be more fun. I don't know. Yeah, so here's the thing, right? Here's the issue. Part of the issue is people think in absolutes. Yeah. 100% or 0% when most stuff is never 100% or 0%. It's somewhere in the middle and there's nuance, right? Yeah. In addition to that, you have social media and you have tribalism where people stick to what their people say. And then here's the other issue too. When people go in with an implicit bias of what they think is going to happen, whatever evidence comes forward, they find ways to say, well, let's figure out why that's not correct. But any in, any information that sort of supports what they believe is like, yeah, uh-huh, uh -huh, see. Right. And the hardest thing I think for anyone to do, or for most people to do, is admit they were wrong, right? Yeah. So if you look at, like this one, I talked about this on my podcast with Garrett. So I, I've been on record saying, listen, I've always had good experience with Garrett, never had a problem with him. Yeah. I feel like personally he handled this situation as bad as you could possibly do. Like, first of all, you win a bunch of money, you win millions of dollars in a game that's very patched. Right, you have questions about a specific hand. For me, if I'm doing that, I tap the table and go, "Okay, you got me for 100." Even if I thought something was up, what I would do is I'd get up, go to production, and go, "Guys, that's something's up with that." But I would do it privately because once you do it publicly, right, you were essentially staking your claim without any evidence, right? Mm -hmm. And I always found, like in you know, in poker, one of the worst things you can do is call someone a cheat, especially when you don't have evidence of it, right? So, so I said this to many people. I said, "Imagine she's innocent. Imagine what she's gone through now." In fairness, it's turned out great for her. She's become a celebrity. Yeah. She's like, everybody's like, wants to, you know, play the Robbie, and she's got a hand named after her and all that sort of stuff. And, and Garrett, on the other hand, has gone the other way. And I saw his tweets recently, and I just couldn't believe it. He's sort of almost taking credit, like the hero in this, that look, at because of me, well, now we're going to have better security and the whole thing, without a single acknowledgement of the damage that he created, too, right, in terms of the doubt and all that sort of stuff. Um, in, in, in her name, no apologies, no thoughts of like giving back the money. I'm sure he's still convinced, right? Yeah. I'm sure he's still convinced. Right. Know something was up, and he's entitled to that opinion. But buddy, if you don't have evidence, a thorough investigation was done. Okay. And I thought the investigation would be what ends up saying, okay, so this is this is gonna this is where you, this is it, the end of the chapter. But for him, he tweeted something, but there was no end to this chapter for him. He's gonna stay in his camp. Of what he believes and listen, like I said, absolutes are stupid. You know, 100% or 0%, that's not where you need to be. There's always a possibility of something. But if you don't, you, the burden of proof is on you when you make accusations like this. And none has come forward, right? Yeah. You know, there have been accusations against, like, all kinds of people I see. I see these crazy fucking theories all over the place, right? It's like, guys, it's all cute. But, you know, unlike the postal situation, you need to actually show me the receipts here before yeah. you can actually come forward with this. So I was really disappointed, you know, in his doubling and tripling down. But again, coming back to the original point is the reason for it is the need to be right, not wanted to like admit like, okay, maybe I messed this up. Okay, maybe I, because if you apologize now or whatever and say, listen, my personal opinion is irrelevant. We have no evidence. So I have to give the money back, period. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'll say this, and you know, I've heard you allude to a lot of this, and I, I've, I, I have to say, you're, you're one of the most level-headed people that I've heard out there, which is, which is a breath of fresh air, and I'll just say, and I'm going to preface this, I'm going to preface and say this, look, I could understand one part of this, I could understand the initial part of Garrett, and, and, and this is just how I feel, I could, in, I could understand the initial reaction of Garrett feeling what he felt and being massively confident about it. And I could even give him a pass on maybe in the heat of not being able to think 
so many layers forward that he made some decisions, which was to go all in right there on the spot, go all in the very next day, etc. I could see being so convinced and on principle doing that. Now, to your point, and where I stop agreeing is, at some point, I believe when the dust cleared, and I'm just going to say this because it's true, I I can't understand some of the decisions like you said because what I don't even think on principle you can stick to this because like you said like I know here's why I'm so passionate about agreeing with you I've been as you know pulled into this and some of the crazy wacky things about when I sit I do this or if I sit I do that and you know they're signaling and all this stuff so I've seen my people like Billy DeGaff be attacked myself now there's stuff that's going up saying that like there's 10 or 15 people uh, like uh, just name like there's like I can name Ten, Ronnie, Mars, Mike X, all these guys at play. Now there's this thing like everyone's involved in chip dumping and faking hands and cheating and doing all this stuff. But I could tell you it's so reckless for people to be this dogmatic because there's a human being behind the accusation that it's innocent into proven guilty. And so where the buck stops for me is like maybe after a few days, that's where you have to say to yourself what you said. Look. I was making millions of dollars with a cherry patch, so this 135, even on principle, isn't worth it. Um, if I can only give you cursory stuff and no actual proof, if Robbie is innocent, I say if because who the fuck knows? I, I, I have my opinions if she is or isn't, but, but until you can prove she isn't, you can't say she is dogmatically because this is now, like you said, she's leaned into it. She's now the Jack Forehand. I mean, the last person that a hand a hand named after him was Doyle, Ten Deuce, and he's a fucking legend. So, like this, you this see what you describe though, and you're right. <clears throat> what you describe is completely unfair, right? Because here's the thing: he can be proven guilty, right? If if she was guilty, she can be proven guilty. Like, well, we have the evidence, we have the people. We yeah. Have what can never happen is after what he's done is proven innocent. In some people's mind, she's guilty, and she can never be proven innocent because you cannot prove such a thing. Right? That's right. And that's people, could, people are always going to think this stuff. So, so whatever he wants, like he damaged her reputation, yeah, right, without credible evidence, without being able to support his claims and stuff like that. A whole bunch of circumstantial stuff. What had she said? This, and I found this to be like a really intriguing, you know, sort of dramatic thing in poker. One of the biggest in that we had so many people on different sides, right? Some people thought for sure. Some people thought definitely not. And you know, there was a lot of fighting because it was there. There is a lot there. I mean, listen. There's a lot of crazy shit that happened here with the guy stealing 15000 off the stack, you know. Yeah. Like, fucking the, the, this guy dating this one. And it's, it's like a really good movie, right? So I can understand why people look at this. And I'm actually surprised because I remember in the initial stages myself, you know, every time new information came up, I'm like, oh, ah. But I always processed every bit of information. Yeah. And says, you go, what does this support? That she did or she didn't? Right? Outside yeah. of my own biases of what I thought. Yeah. When I first heard it, like I was at Poker Go Studio, someone said, what happened? It's like, oh, it sounds like, you know, she cheated. I didn't see anything. I didn't know anything. First thought. Then you watch the hand. You're like, wait a minute. I don't know. And then you hear her talk and all this stuff. So there's a really fascinating, like, you know, hand on so many levels. But, you know, like we said, you know, I think I would never, ever accuse somebody of cheating because I had a hunch. You can't, you can't. You know, where it's like, this doesn't add up or whatever like that. What I would do is, what would happen with the possible investigation? Which was, let's go over all the fucking hands. Let's see yeah. if we can find evidence of other stuff like that. And they did. There's nothing. Like, do we, I just, then it came to me where I was like, okay, do we really think that she's been on the stream like four times and this was the one hand she chose right. to just get it in fucking 50-50 and run it twice? Like, it just didn't make a lot of sense, you know? But no. Again, I'm not at zero, I'm not at 100. Anything's possible in this life, but I think, again, the most important takeaway is, and it's funny because Garrett tweeted this. Garrett tweeted saying, guys, it's really irresponsible to call people cheaters without evidence. Let's be better. And I was like, what the fuck? Who, who did this more than you in the history of that was That was tweeted, that was tweeted, I mean, like, that was tweeted since this incident? I didn't see that one. No, this one was a, like a, I don't know, it was a couple months ago. He tweeted out, no joke, I had it. I yeah, it. yeah. He said, 
So the guys, you know, because he was talking about DGAF or other people being, but he's like, you know, it's really important not to accuse people without evidence. Let's be better. I know this firsthand. I'm like, yeah, because you're the most guilty of it. You did not provide us evidence, you know? Ah. Yeah, no. And, and there was a lot of collateral damage from, from that accusation because, like, there's a lot of other people that were hurt. Like, I, I literally had... Uh, a female dealer, Lauren, who was accused as well when everyone went on their witch hunt and was like looking for every stupid thing and, and accentuating it. And then respectfully, people with their shows, putting them on and just letting them run rough shot with these these ideas. And it's like she cried her eyes out for a week and almost quit because she couldn't take the pressure. And this girl hasn't isn't capable of something like that if her life depended on it. And, you know, it's the same thing with like Billy. He you know, this guy has been in a 40 day funk. He can't, he's just starting now to come out of it and feel his legs and went from a guy who likes to have a few drinks, having a good time to like the most angry person I've seen in the last 40 days. Myself, I actually went into a little dip of like depression and didn't want to play. And, you know, I've been like, like you said, no matter what happens now, somebody still in their mind when they see me is going to think that uh, because somebody re recklessly just happened to want to go there, you know? It was crazy. I, so I've never been accused in my life of cheating at poker. Yeah. But I had one accusation where Norman Chad, right, did a video about the World Series of Poker when I won Player of the Year, which the prize is exactly zero dollars. It's just bragging rights. And I posted the points on my vlog every single day so everyone could see what they were. You know, I was helping the guy, Rob Campbell, to, to make it a fair competition. I, on the video, I said, hey, why don't you drop a stack or whatever, right? So he releases a video suggesting that I knew that I didn't win and that I cheated and stole this thing. And from that moment, wow. probably a little bit before, I didn't know this about man that. was dead to me, right? Because that's questioning your integrity in a way that's like beyond okay to do, like, it's essentially an accusation without evidence like that. And actually, there's plenty of evidence to show that I didn't know, right? Yeah. If I, I was posting the results every fucking day. So I remember the feeling I felt, right? And uh, the thoughts I had about him specifically. And like, from that moment, dead to me. Yeah. Fuck that guy. Really? Yeah, yeah. Nobody, you don't do shit like that. You just don't fucking do it. Apologize, like, oh, sorry about that. Fuck you, dude. That's, you, you passed the point of, of you know, reconciliation with that. You fucking piece of shit. That's what you want. Well, who fucking asked you to make this fucking video, you piece of shit, calling me, saying I fucking, oh, I know, we'll never know. You know, we'll never know if you're a fucking, well, actually, you will. Never mind. But anyway. Yeah. That pissed me off so much. So, I guess in a very small sample of not even being accused of cheating, but accused of, like, knowingly fucking stealing yeah. the of the year for zero money, I can't imagine what you... And these guys and her and everybody else went through for those of those, you know, that are that are innocent or whatever to be accused is the most it's like the most brutal thing you can do. To somebody. I, I will tell you and you gave me the chills because it's rare that somebody kind of gets it. And I will say this since, since September 29th, maybe about a week after when they started redirecting their attention to everybody, including me, uh, it has literally been one of the worst 30 or 60 days of my life. And and. And to the point to where, like I said, I'm not being dramatic about it. I have been so angry. I handled the situation wrong. I started like, you know, how you're just like, fuck you, fuck you. Like, that's how I went. And I did it publicly and I and, and I fought back and I started defending my people. And honestly, it really wasn't worth it because all because anytime you put any of that into the universe, they just feed on it like it's blood in the water. It doesn't accomplish anything. They 10 X you more of the hate. And then it even spirals into this big tumbleweed. And so what I've learned is, is that how to handle it is, and it's the toughest thing ever, is to try to just avoid it, not look at it. But I got to tell you, it's, it's like, it's, it's just horrible. And I don't, uh, I don't wish it upon anybody because once somebody attacks your integrity, really attacks you, it's like, um, it's hurtful. And I just wish I had a plan. Like I wish I could start some kind of movement to stop this type of stuff. And when I see this happening to other people, it's becoming a real passion of mine to like want to reach out to them and help them and say, look, you know, um, don't let this affect you because I know how it is. And I've done that recently with a couple people that I've seen been attacked. And I'm, I, I DM'd them and I've said, hey, do you need to talk? 
because like let me tell you what I'm going through and and it sucks and so anyways that you you bringing this up and me bringing it up yeah, put well, me when, up when you when what you're saying essentially to me is like when you jump in the cesspool you'll be covered in shit yeah even if you're right, right? yeah yeah so like the the tough part is this and I've dealt with this for with poker forums and whatever for twenty something years when somebody starts talking shit about you and if they're lying right you have two choices one you engage. And what that does is it leads you down a rabbit hole of back and forth and back and forth on Twitter and this and that. Can't win. You know, defending and this and that. And you're now you're in the you're in the cesspool, right? So that's option one, right? Why? And then option two is to ignore it, right? Option two though is when somebody's lying and you don't say anything and you let it out there, that becomes the story. So what do you right? do? You what, what's 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 option three? You don't, you don't, huh? But what's mm -hmm. option three? How, how, so are you drawing dead? What, one and two. Well, what I'm saying is, so like what I, what I, I mean, listen, I'm mostly out of it now. I don't get involved in Twitter beefs anymore or whatever. Like the way that I handle it typically is I don't engage. Like I say, something like that would happen. You know, I don't engage with every post on Twitter. I'll make my statement. I'll talk about it on my podcast. I'll say it and then I'll bury it. You know, right. I'm not going to like continually go. Cause I remember it was like, it was such a, I remember in forums, like I would go back and forth with people and they were just like. It was just constant negativity and says, well, right. they weren't listening to me. I'm telling the truth. And then you're just like, well, hey, well, well then why? It's like, what more can I tell you? This right. Is exactly what well, I, I've, blah, 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 blah. yeah, I've noticed that there's, there's a couple of people out there. One in particular, I won't mention his name. Everyone knows who I'm talking about, but that's fine. Cause I like to not say it and let them know that I believe in my heart would rather be right than have it than, than to have what's done be right. Meaning that person would rather be right than have, uh, have uh, an outcome that's right just at, at any cost and that leads me to the question what what do you think about some of the people out there that are I don't know if you influencers uh, shows like do you think it's morally right to just go after clicks and and to put a lot of this out there and to go after people like I guess that's along the same line I guess everyone has the right to do whatever I don't know well listen I've never liked so this is funny because it brings me back to the original time this happened. But I never really liked clickbait, you know, the clickbait world, and that's sort mm -hmm. of what we're in now. You know, yeah. that's kind of how things work. And I remember it was this. This was how like the whole beef started with you know me and Doug Polk many years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. you know he was doing clickbaity titles, and one he put was like, you know, this YouTube video that said you know Jason Mercer cheating allegations all in capital, right? Yeah. When someone sees that title, they go, oh God, you know, what did Jason do? Right? Yeah. Right. Meanwhile, that's not what it was about at all. Right. That was a clickbait title. You know, this was about a Chinese poker thing where Jason didn't want to play against the guy because ah. he was suspicious. But not Jason, right? But the thing is, is once you see that title out there and that's out there, you know, that disperses people's names because people don't look for the details. You know, they read the title and then they yeah. move on. So you were, you were I, labeled. You know, I said I didn't think that was right and whatever, yeah. and that created a beef back and forth. And I've always had a problem with that. Listen, I mean, I understand why people use clickbait titles on YouTube to get clicks and stuff like that, but you sell a little bit of your soul when you do stuff like that when it's disingenuous or when it's way off base, right? Yeah. Like this Dick Napkin guy. Um, well, I, Dick, Dick, I always call him Dick Napkin because- I don't know who that is. It's literally, his name's DK Lappin, okay. but I go with Dick Napkin <laughs> because I imagine like, what is the lowest form of tissue? And it's probably a Dick Napkin that you wipe off. <laughs> you know, you know, this is like, this is what he embodies, right? So it's like so perfect that this is his name because he's like a low level troll. Right? right. So, like he doesn't. He blocks me on Twitter. I have him blocked, whatever. <laughs> but my, my my name is always in his fucking mouth. He can't stop. You know. But when I when I uh, bust a tournament, explosive bust out, and he's gleeful. You know. He's sitting there all happy because I busted because he's fucking sitting there with envy because he can't do what I fucking do. Right. I think do I, I think at the core he that wants me to walk up and but listen, Dick Napkin, if you're watching this, okay. You want me to walk up in the sunset, and be out of poker, right? You know. You know. So you. That ain't gonna fucking happen, bro. That ain't gonna fucking happen. Right. Okay? So so take so so take your dip I don't know. I fucking I love fucking with the guy. He always, he's obviously like I said, I'm blocked on his Twitter, he's blocked on mine. But I saw the video that he tweeted and he was a little giggling because I busted. You know, and, and then he puts the title, explosive bust out, because I stood out of my fucking chair, right? And there was a stuff, oh, 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 fuck. I said, the guy is such a fucking low life, bro. Dick napkin, dick napkin, get a fucking life. How about that? Big fucking napkin. That's what you are. You pathetic fucking excuse for a fucking human being. You dirty, disgusting, crusted up dick napkin. Anyway. 
Dude, I am not an Insta bro, and I am not someone that looks to people who are successful. But we gotta hang out, bro. <laughs> Seriously, I we we gotta. Ser- that would probably be some good times. Like I, you're you're actually really from the same cut as me. Um, do you still take a lot of heat even now? Like, do you? I mean, do you still take a ton of heat or a ton of hate, or are you kind of out of that? Uh, it was. Is that a thing? I don't really like. I don't pay. I really don't like. It's only when people send me stuff. Or stuff I see, but like I said, I don't engage on Twitter with all this stuff. I, I can, I actually find it funny, and I, you know, people ask me like about this earlier, but I think like I don't know, you're you're fifties, so you would know this, but yeah, I think in your twenties, right? Whether you think you do or not, you care what people think, right? Yeah, just that's part of being in your teens and your twenties. When you're in your thirties, you don't think you care what people think, or you try to say that you don't, but you still kind of do. Right. Once you get into your forties, go fuck yourself. I really <laughs> don't care. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, but, I got the life that I always wanted. I got the wife that I always wanted. I got, you know, I, I've got, I've got the dream life that I always wanted to create. And um, I don't allow, I don't, I really don't. I just, I, I believe in authenticity. And I guess what I was saying earlier about this generation that concerned me was the lack of inauthenticity. People are trying to be something that they think is what is palatable rather than just be authentically who they are and experience emotion the way that they do. Yeah. You know, and, and all those types of things. So I I don't really get a lot of flack lately because I've been in the street, but I'm sure after this interview, I mean, going with the dick napkin rant, that, you know, it'll Yeah, start yeah. I mean, because you're, you're, very, basement you're basement very, right you're very, you're right? very in, but, okay, but, no, he's in his basement right now wanking to this because it's going to be <laughs> Well, you're giving, yeah. you're giving him what he wants is attention. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, buddy. I'm giving you yeah. fake material. I'm yeah, you yeah, yeah. All right, here you go. There you go, Dick Knapp. Get all for you. you well, a couple more now. I, I think you hit it too. I think a lot of this does come from people that are doing this are probably highly insecure inside and probably fiercely jealous of some of the people are doing it too. I know one of the people that come after me pretty hard about my integrity now um, is someone, uh, someone that's was a failed streamer and probably is jealous of that. That's the only thing I can think of other than we're just nothing alike, but. Um, but it's pretty funny. Now, you mentioned being married. How long have you been married to Amanda? It is, yeah? We got married in 2019. 2019. Right? Well, you COVID you happened. do realize, even, yeah. even with the beard and how much cooler you look, you do realize you're way fucking over your head with her, right? I'm way what? You're way over your head with her. Like, she's so pretty compared to you. <laughs> <laughs> So I can say I'm married. I'm telling you what, though, she didn't do so bad either. <laughs> she didn't. I'm fucking charming, charismatic dude. Right? What's going on? Yeah, I'm shit. kidding. I'm kidding. She, no, she. I know it's funny, but yeah, we dated. We were dating way back when, in around 2010, 2011. I was in love with her back then. She was a young, you know, she was partying. She was a young girl. Yeah. Was like more, you know, I was in my 30s. I was established, so it didn't work out back then. You know, fast forward seven, eight years, she comes back to town because Hanks and. uh Remco wanted her to do this Friday night poker show. Hmm. So I, you know, I could go to dinner. I figured, okay, maybe we'll have some fun, you know, hook up or something like that. And then she got vulnerable with me at dinner and shared some stuff. And it really connected us. And like, it was literally two months after I proposed, I still had the ring because I bought her the ring 10 years before. No shit. I had it in my safe. Yeah. I had that <clears> ring there and I never got rid of it. Um, and so then like I proposed to her on New Year's Eve and we were married in the May. Of, of like of that month because at that point we just knew you know I was in a relationship with somebody she was in a relationship with uh, another guy before that you know and we, we those ended and it was just like it just I think you know too like you know I sort of talked about how you evolve as a human if we got married way back then it would have been a disaster what, yeah I get it she wasn't in a mental place where she could be married to me and I wasn't either I wasn't strong enough whatever so I matured I did work she did work and then we get to a place where it's like you know what this just works and it's been blissful like you know, for a lot of people, the whole COVID thing, you know, you know, you're newly married and there's all the stuff and there's nothing to do. You can't go nowhere. So that's either going to make you or break you, right? Spending all that time. With right. And for us, it just made us, you know, closer. We had a good rhythm going and, uh, you know, it was, it's, yeah, it's been great. Well, I'm going to dig into that because something you said I want to know about. But first of all, having having someone like that, because it is, it, it, believe it or not, it is very rare. And to have that over all the poker, over all the money, over whatever, that is the absolute nuts 
for sure. So I'm, I'm very happy that you got that because not a lot of people can say that and feel exactly how you feel. So good for you guys. I, I, I really think that's awesome. And, and congratulations on that. Now, let me ask you, you said <clears throat> some years back you guys dated. It was it just you met, went on a few dates. Like, how did it get to a point where you were in love and bought a ring? And did she know you well, had the ring? Know, I don't think dating is the right word. It was like banging. <laughs> you bought a ring for a girl you were banging. Well, yeah, I wanted. Like, she was so listen. I don't know, like, maybe she was a poker news reporter. Chief, okay. Right? And yeah. I was probably you know, to, to, by today's standards, incredibly inappropriate with her. But she sort of liked that. Yeah. You know? And I, yeah. I, 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 so, yeah. Like, I remember the first time we met, I had like one of those little golf club things, you know, like those little the handheld things to practice with. Yeah. And I'm just like standing next to her. And we were flirty already. We're doing stuff. so. I'm just like tapping her butt with it. You know, just she, she was my end point like that. And so we giggled and laughed and you know we're inappropriate with each other and stuff like that. And uh, um, it was just like a fun flirty thing. But again, like I said, she was very young, you know, and. Uh, living, you know, living the Hollywood life, if you will. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it just wasn't time at that point. Yeah. You know, you would get chewed up by the feminist group and so many people by hitting that gal in her ass. And I just, again, I'm like... I wasn't, I wasn't beating her. No, <laughs> no I, I'm, I'm making a point to say it's so stupid. Like, so what? Men and women flirt. And how do you flirt without a little inappropriateness? Like, I know people are going to hammer me for this statement, probably hammer you too, but I don't care. It's like everyone is so, their fucking panties are so bunched that like you have to, you have to almost walk around like being who you're not unless you just want to be me too'd or outed or called out or whatever you call it or canceled. And it's just so crazy. But, but back to my question you must have been something more. So, did she know you were in love with her at that time when it didn't work out? So, it was at a time where I mean, obviously, she knew I had the ring. Oh, right? she did. Okay, I, that's my that was my I next never question. Offered her the ring, right? I never like I didn't propose to her back then. She knew, but she was going through a lot of her own stuff. Right? Yeah, she's young. She's really, you know in her twenties and like just getting her feet wet and like I'm, I was more like established, like. You know, older, like I'm 10 years old. Than yeah, me. yeah. So I'm more like a picket fence type guy now. Like, let's get, you know, that. Yeah. She wasn't ready for that. You know, she wasn't ready for that. And, uh, you know, she's trying to figure out who she was, too, and all that sort of stuff. So, in the end, it worked out for the best because, like I said, you weren't ready. You know, made, made it happen back then. It wouldn't work. It would be impossible where we were at. But, um, you know, different time in our lives. We still, I still kept tabs on her and she still kept tabs on right. me, you know, through the years. Despite, you know, it's not, you know, her living in North Carolina or whatever like that. We still chatted here and there. Um, not like flirty like that. Well, I guess the thing is, is we, we've always just talked to each other that way. You know, that's just, we've always been flirty with each other. Yeah. So even, even though, yeah, it was never like, we never crossed the line, you know, during that period. I never saw her or anything like that. At, but, that, uh, at that time, did it hurt like a month? I'll tell you what I did realize mm. too. So I wrote this thing on, I did this course, like an emotional intelligence course about stuff. And they said like, one of the things, one of the tasks I was tasked with is like to write out the woman of my dreams, right? And then describe a day with this woman. So I did that. And then I realized later, I, I read the thing. And I'm like, damn, that sounds like her. Right. <laughs> you know? right. And what I realized I was doing was in every relationship or every girl I dated after her, she was my measuring stick. Yeah. And nobody could measure up because they weren't actually her. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, Ultimately, it was just meant to be, and I'm, I'm glad they worked out, even though it was messy. Right? Yeah, sometimes sounds, that's yeah. How it works. Did it, it hurt like a Did it hurt like a motherfucker when you had to walk away, feeling how you felt for that span where you were yeah, with I've her? I've never been depressed, never. Except never in my life I've been depressed, except for the time way back then, where when I realized you know me and her weren't going to work out in like 30 days. I had my, wow. my agent Brian order send me this list of 20 things to do. Like go on a vacation, you know, watch a poker, watch this, this. But I was obsessed, you know. It was like totally. It was back in the early days of stalking too, you know, or like Facebook and all. I'm like, what's she doing? <laughs> That's, the worst, do, That's the worst thing to do, but you can't help it. That's the worst thing to do, but you can't help it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was doing all the wrong things, but it was the only time in my life that I ever genuinely was like, you know, where I felt low and down. So yeah. I'm a pretty happy guy overall. Yeah. But it was for a reason, you know, because that's what it was. True love was for me, and I've learned. You know, too, with age, you know, people talk about the word love, and I feel like I understand it better now than ever. And I think for most of my life, for most most people's life, they confuse lust with love. 
yeah. right? Right. Oh my god, I love this woman. Yeah, you want you're sexually that's all sexual, right? In yeah. a lot of ways. But when you when you really love somebody, you love them as they are, on days when their hair's a mess and they got no makeup on and you're just you're gross and you're you know, whatever, and like you appreciate some I, I guess the way that I would define what true love meant to me is loving somebody exactly as they are, not for what potentially you potentially see in them, right? Because I could be judgmental. I could be like, well, if you do this, do this, you'd be... With her greatness, her flaws, whatever, if she wants to have cereal for dinner, that's go for it, girl. Yeah. That's you. You know what I mean? I no longer just, like sit in judgment of her. I just accept her as she is, and I try to support her completely and then fully in everything that she does. You know, it's crazy. There's <clears throat> a lot of people don't understand what, what you just said. And the truth is in relationships, uh, if two people took that stance and aren't always looking for like, hey... You need to be this. You need to be more like that. You need to be better here. You need to treat me better. You need, to, you know, what you just said. If two people can 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 approach it from that from that approach, you can't stop it. Like that's 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 the secret to it. And believe it or not, this is one of my lanes when it comes to that type of stuff. So I've often even talked to people about this or help them that type of thing. So I, you you literally nailed it. And I got to tell you, the people are going to love this this content because you know not everyone kind of opens up like that so I, I i think this portion is going to be received well and honestly i am really really i don't know you that well but i'm really happy for you because what you just told me is very rare and most people look for that their whole life so good for you man and 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 amanda i'm, gl I'm happy for you guys legitimately that's really cool really cool you know i appreciate it and like i said i mean you know for the type of person that i am i think also too when you play poker for a living yeah part of what you become good at part of what you become good at is judging you're judging character. You're judging people. You're right. constantly your reads. profiling people, and you're thinking, "You're what I'm looking for is I'm looking for your strengths and I'm looking for your flaws." Flaws. Now, when you practice something uh, as a daily rhythm thing or a, in your daily life, this can seep into your other life too, right? So, in my relationships and stuff, I'm still. It's hard to turn that part of your brain off. Right. right? Yeah. So you think of like you know a guy like Bobby Fischer in chess or whatever the case may be. A lot of young chess prodigies. What do they do? They spend their days playing a game. That is about constant paranoia about what the next person may do, right? Yeah. That can lead to right. That. So when I was practicing judgment in my poker career and it seeped over to relationships, that doesn't work. I have to learn to turn that off. And I've never been able to do that until her, right? Because let's say, for example, you know, you have your ways that you do stuff. And I'm, I'm pretty organized. I wake up at 10 a.m. I you know, work out. I do this. Like, she's not. She does her own thing, right? Yeah. So in the past, I would probably be resentful. Or annoyed, be like, you know, you need to do it like I do it. Yeah. Or, you know, this is the right way, yours is the wrong way. I don't do that anymore. I realize what's right for me is what I do. What's right for her is her way. And I'm going to support her in her way instead of trying to make her live in my way. And, you know, she doesn't like that sort of... I mean, I, I eat when I'm dieting and I'm working out. I eat, a, I eat off a spreadsheet, bro. Like, I measure everything. Right. You know? She just wakes up and eats what she feels like. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a different vibe. Yeah. But, once you learn to just, you know, accept yeah. people's value systems in the way they are and not try to change them to do yours, I think then real love can happen. And that's what happened for me. It was like just total accept. And I realized that one, one morning I woke up and I'm like, man, I just, so many things she does I disagree with, like for me, but it doesn't change how much I love her, no matter what. Well, I think what you're saying in a nutshell is you finally found somebody you love more than you love yourself. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe so. Like, that makes some sense too. You know, I mean, because that's what you're basically saying. Yeah. And you, we talked off air for like a half a second before we went live and I brought up like your, your beard game is fucking spot on. And a, a lot of chicks out there dig it. I see the posts like they're like, man, Daniel 2.0 is like the nuts. And I know you're taken and all that, but you mentioned to me, your wife likes it and that's why your beard game is on. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So like, I wouldn't have had this beard. For sure. Like, she's I mean, right. And then I'm, she, I'm I'm straight, but she's right. She likes the beard. She yeah. thinks it's cool. She's, she always liked it. So I'm like, listen, it's easier for me, right? Don't have to shave. Yeah, and yeah. Stuff. <laughs> but actually, I've learned to like it too, and I like to appreciate it as well. So, um, you know, but yeah, but, mo but mainly it's like when you're in a relationship, you know, if, some, if she says she, she likes beard, why wouldn't you? Like, does, so she like you, does she like you uh, hairy all over, or are you manscaped? No, I'm manscaped. Okay, for sure. all right. But here's the thing: is like I get random people on Twitter who tell me, "Bro, you gotta shave the beard; it's gross." Yeah. And I'm like, okay, two choices: listen to random Bob <laughs> seven three nine four on Twitter or my wife. I don't know; it doesn't feel close. But why? Go what? 
why in the hell would anyone care out there random if you had a beard or not? That's just perplexing to me. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, I'm going to read something to you that goes back to what our other point was. I don't want to get back on the subject because that ship has sailed, but I was going to read it then. I want to read it. I've reposted this everywhere I possibly could. It resonated with me. I don't know if you saw me comment on it. You put back to our other point because you were taking some heat about knocking your chair over and giving a fuck about being knocked out of that tournament, which you should. It says, when you become a public, you posted this, when you become a public figure, some will like you and others won't. Such is life. The truly saddest existence are those who don't like you, but are obsessed with you, Dick Dick Napkin, and constantly talking about you. It cannot deliver happiness, only envy. That's a fucking great post, bro. I got this thing saved. I reposted it. It actually helped me too because, you know, I, I was kind of dealing with like, what the fuck? And, and so I just wanted to get that out. I forgot to do it when, when we talked about that. It was really a brilliant post. And, um, and you're racist, right? Like when you said that about Rampage and the guy that looked like him. How do, how do you want to deal with that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. I thought that was hysterical. See, that's the difference. He looked like him. I'll tell you what, <laughs> or not funny, but this is something I realized too with this. It's like, you know, like something you have hate or people don't like you. Right? Yeah. There isn't a single person, there isn't a single human being in the world that like doesn't like me or hates me that is somebody that I look at and go, man, that's too bad because I would really like to be friends with them, right? <laughs> right? Right? You know what I mean? There's nobody like, like that, I'm like, I wish, you know, that really sucks. I wish that person liked me because, oh man, they're so up my alley. Like if people don't like me for who I am, great because it weeds the field for me right because yeah. i like to be authentic i am who i am i say what i believe i don't sugarcoat things i love it and you know that can get you in trouble with, in some ways but at the same time like i said it lets you know well i don't know that's not a good way to say it but uh but i guess like i said yeah ultimately I, I, i'm not too pained by people who don't like me because like i said those are not people that vibe with me anyway like right. they wouldn't be in my crew, if you will. Yeah, the I got it. My crew, the people that I hang with, people that, they get me, they appreciate me yeah. for who I am, and, and I'm good with that. You know, and most people do. Listen, this is another brain default thing that we have as human beings is you can see 99 good comments, right, about something, and you see one bad one. And like, what does the brain actually veer towards? The, the bad one. Of course. And we were like, so now we forget about the 99 good ones. We're like, well, why does this guy see this shit? This is. Totally. So this is something that I learned to sort of, I, you know what I learned this on Twitter by one guy. This was so, such an epiphany for me. This guy tweeted some shitty at me, right? And I responded to it, okay? And he replied saying, oh, so sorry, I didn't even mean that. I just did that because I figured you were more likely to respond. Wow. And I was like, oh my God, this guy shit posted because he wanted a response from me. And that's what I'm feeding into, right? I'm feeding the negative. So what I learned to do, or I try to do for the most part is respond to the positive stuff. Right. And don't respond to the bad stuff. And yeah. sort of reset <clears throat> sort of the mental, um, you, re, you know, re, re, reset the game. Because this guy really believed that because, it, you know, he was conditioned to think that like negativity gets more attention. And the sad part is it's true, right? It you is notice true. It. Like people do that all the time. Well, They're always commenting back and forth on, Stuff that's you know negative. Well, that's why I people watch. Really I that's, feel like I've done a good job. I don't get. I don't engage. <clears throat> like I can't remember the last Twitter beef I've had. It's been a yeah. long time. Yeah. What advice would you have for me in this respect? So, I'm running, and I want to talk to you about uh, Hustler Casino soon in a minute. But I'm I'm running a, a, a very public live stream. The fact is, I'm not saying it because oh wow, but the fact is, we're the number one poker stream as far as views, clicks. Uh, everything like we're we're just it, it, nothing lasts forever that could be over in a year I, I, whatever but right now we are and I have been like you my whole life and and how I've been is I am who I am I say what the fuck I want to say whatever but I have been I feel like I've been watered down where I'm like so careful because you know I got sponsors or this or I don't want to start another war or I don't want to you know have more negative what, what advice would you give me in my position that, in, you know, I'm playing on stream two or three times a week. I'm running a successful poker show. Everyone's coming uh, and, and throwing barbs at us and me specifically. What would you do? Would you stick to the plan and just say, fuck it and be who I am? At least I can, you know, uh, live, you know, live with that. Or would you say, keep water? Like, what, what advice would you give me? Honestly, being well, in my shoes, I'm in a different spot than you. 
for me personally, I think the most valuable thing we have is our own authenticity. And when you when you sell that, or you you, you sell out, or you 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 conform, yeah, you know, to what others think. Like, listen, you've done it your way, and as you said, you know, your show is very successful, and you've been doing it your way. Some people are not going to like you. Some people are not going to like your shows. But you know what? Some of those people still watch anyway. They do. A lot of them do. Because they're waiting for you to say something. Most of them do, yeah. They sit in their basement and yell at you about it, right? (laughs) So, you know, the deal is this. Like, I think, like, first and foremost, do what makes you happy. And if you feel as though, you know, you're being repressed in a sense of, like, not being able to be your true authentic self, um, then, I I mean, I I would would veer from, I would veer away from that. I I don't think you have to, um, what's it called? Bow to the mob, if you will. Right. Like, the mob's going to have their opinion. Fine. Whatever. You'll move on. They'll move on. Like, you know, I, I, there's obviously a line, right? Like, I mean, if you go full Kanye or some shit like that, fuck you. Know, <laughs> yeah. You no, no, no. And I get it. That's the thing. But, like, I think intent matters, too. You know? Right. In terms of what you're doing. Like, are you purposely... Like, if you're going to go on your show and you're going to demean people and be an asshole just no. for the sake of being an asshole... Then I deserve it. Then you're an asshole. Then I'm an asshole. Like, yeah. But if you're just being you and, you're, and you're, your intention is good... You know, I think that's probably, you know, we've talked about this somewhat a lot, but like, I think the thing that's lost on the social media generation and all this is intention. Right. right? Like, what do the people mean by that? Like, when we, if, if people heard me and Phil Ivey on the golf course, if there was a camera on there, we would be canceled, like, forever. <laughs> but we're boys. <clears throat> yeah, right? I get it. Yeah. So I can, I can, I can shoot the shit with him, and he can shoot the shit right back with me. Right. But like, you know, but the shit we say to each other is joking. Yeah. It's all fun loving and it's friendly. So it's about context. It's about intent. You know, when, when, when I talk, when I speak to him, but obviously other people who have no say in the game, if they saw that, they would decide for me and Phil what's appropriate in our relationship between him and I. Yeah. If we're by ourselves. And that's where shit gets crazy. Right? Yeah. Like, I mean... You know, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I know what you're saying. And, and of course, you know, like even on stream, you know, people don't realize that, you know, all these guys I'm playing with on the weekly are like my close friends. And one of the crazy players is Chris Ludacris. I don't know if you know who he is or you watch the show, but uh, him and I have a rivalry and, you know, we troll each other. And I have to really be careful because people really legitimately think I'm an asshole to him. But we lean into our trolls. Like when he gets stuck north of like 150 in a real a small anti game, I, I shut down. I, I I give him some air until I see his like his legs come back under him, and then I go again. And he does it to me too. <clears throat> and he's Chinese, so I got to be very careful because sometimes I'll say, "Man, this Chinese kid has heart," or um, he's a kamikaze, which is Japanese. And I'll say, you know, "Oh my God, this Japanese kid." And I take so much heat for being racist and be, uh, being mean to him, which people don't understand. You know, we're just friends. Like, we're legitimately friends, and we, like, laugh late. He wants me to commentate on the shows he's on so I could say how bad he is, and he can laugh about it. Like, that's what people don't really get, is the, is the yeah, intent. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Like, so, mm-hmm. people, ever since I was young, I always appreciated guys like uh, Rich Little and all those stuff. Like, oh, my God. Accents. And I've always been good at doing accents in different languages. Yeah. And I find, like, when I meet Indian people, Indian people are, like, the nicest, nicest people in the world. Right. right. So it's crazy. Consistently, the nicest, most humble people. And whenever I meet them, like I'll do the Indian accent with them. They laugh, they love it, they yeah. enjoy it. We have a good time. We bond, we connect over it over it. Sure. So we're all good with it, right? Yeah. Who's upset? It's the, you know, the kids at Berkeley who decided <laughs> that I shouldn't speak to them that way, even though they appreciate it and they like it, right? Yeah. And they're like, you know, they're engaging. I'm not mocking them. I'm not belittling them. I I'm know. not talking down to them. I'm actually connecting with them. I'm bonding with them in a way, right? So the idea that if you were, to, if I were to do an Indian accent, this, and then to take that to the idea of racism, so what do you think that means? You think I don't like Indian people, right? Do you think if I did an accent in an Indian, that means I think less of Indian people? Like, is that how you get to the equation? It's the opposite of that. You know, the term cultural appropriation comes around all the time, and what people don't realize is 99% of the time, it's appreciation, not appropriation, appreciation yeah. for culture. That people love and admire and respect and want to be a part of, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. So, um, but yeah, like, I think ultimately, like, just being authentic and being who you are, with being mindful, of course. Like, if somebody doesn't like that stuff, you know, I would apologize. Like, if I said that and it was offended somebody, you know, oh no, I'm sorry, I, I, I was, I didn't mean it that way. I was just trying to joke around with you, whatever. And if they don't like it, I would stop immediately. Yeah. Right? 
but I'm not going to stop talking to this guy who I'm friends with because Justin Bonomo says I shouldn't. You know what I mean? Right. I'm not going to, like... Is he from... Is he from the... Is so Justin what is, right, what is appropriate? Is I'm Justin cool. is Justin one who speaks out on that, or is a is okay. have you had experience with Justin in that lane? Is he someone that will say like he thinks those things? You mentioned his name. Well, he's wacko. You know, he's like I I don't know. Huh? I have no idea. So I, you, I, I, it's news to me. I don't know anything about him. All I know is that I can't I can't watch him play because I can't wait fifteen minutes in between decisions. That's all I know about him. Yeah. No. He's a. Uh... He's got. He's like the younger pro. Like he's, uh, he's 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 irredeemable at this point. He's really? Down the rabbit hole and completely brainwashed and indoctrinated. Like. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Ideology. Yeah, no, no. He's completely off off his rock. Like, <laughs> he would, you know, he said something about, you know, if 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 it bothered ten percent of people, if I tied my shoes in public, I wouldn't do it. Right. Wow. So that's where his mindset's at. You know, he wants to live a life where, like, well, and they offend somebody. So. Oh wow. You know. So like he's anyway, well, I don't go on that tangent. That's too. fine. I snapped so this. He would be the one that will decide for me what's appropriate between people that I hang out with or my friends and stuff like that, and what's right and what's wrong. And I don't obviously subscribe to that sort of thing. Totally get it. I will leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> I snapped this yesterday on Instagram. I don't even know who this coach is, and it does say "Rest in peace, peace, Coach Leach." So I don't know if he's alive. But I saw this. He's the co- he either is or was the coach of Mississippi State, the football coach. And it says his quote: "Everybody is offended by everything. Now I'm offended by people who get offended by everything. So maybe that's what I'll just do. Is I'll just I'm just offended. I identify yeah, as I identified as offended. I think his name's Stephen Fry. He does this little bit. If you find it, I'll, I'll send it to you. It's really funny. He does a little bit about being offended. He's like, you know, everybody's offended. He's like. Well, what happens when you're offended? He's like, nothing happens. You don't get leprosy or anything. You know? He's like, when I see boy bands on my television, I find it offensive. You know, call the police and go, they're at it again. They're on the telly. Yeah. They're wearing white, they're dancing around. It's like, nothing happens. Like, you don't, you know, I think people misunderstand what a right is. And the idea that you have a right, like, or that this idea that you have a right to not be offended, when in reality, you have no idea what's going to offend people, right? right? So to live your life in such a way where you're constantly concerned or worried about possibly offending people when you don't even know what's offensive is exhausting. It's exhausting, right? yeah. It is walking around on, on a level of eggshells where, where in reality, if, if you're just authentic and your intention is good, people appreciate that, right? Yeah. Like when I'm talking to these Indian people in an Indian accent, what do you think my intention is? These are fans a lot of the time coming up to me I'm giving them a memorable experience. They can take, they take video of it. They love it. They enjoy it. They embrace it. I'll do Israeli. I do all this sort of stuff. But then you're told by this other group of people that what you're doing, oh, it's bad. It's racist. It's like, how do you get to that conclusion <laughs> that you're like mimicking yeah. or, or like imitating? Like, why do people not say that about Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Like, that's a thing. People do his accent all the time. Yeah, like, right. You know, he's a German, whatever. But like... There's not that same sort of vis- visceral... I think Austrian, but who cares? if I was doing an accent mm. to mock and demean a culture, totally out of fucking line. Totally yeah. out of line. If well, I'm doing so in a playful, fun way, you know, to connect and engage with people, on, you know, on their level, and, you know, I see that as a positive. I think comedy and humor and laughter brings us together, and the attack on comedy in our world today is, you know, you see a lot of guys like Seinfeld and Chris Rock and... Well, the stage tells where like they won't even do college campuses anymore because comedy by definition is offensive like oh yeah you're many people you're making you can't fun say of shit and it's like they're getting so near they're getting so zeroed in on like the smallest little things that they're feeling uncomfortable about telling jokes now in a way that I don't know, you know what I'm saying I, I totally know what you're saying. All I know is I'm like, even though I'm old, I'm in the wrong generation. I need, I definitely am because it's crazy to me. And by the way, you probably offended all the Germans because I think Arnold is Aust- from Austria. So you're going to have to deal with that publicly. I just want to throw that out there. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> so let me ask you this question. <clears throat> I hope he's from there because that's where I think he's from. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Um, what do you think, just your thoughts on the last past year and some change for Hustler Casino Live? Just anything, just shock on it. Well, I'll good, good, bad, or indifferent. Good, bad, or indifferent. And then I want to, and then I want to know what you think about Nipplegate after. 
Okay. Right. So yeah, so so the, so the truth is, you know, I'm not an avid watcher of full streams, but often in my feed on Twitter, there's this big brouhaha about a crazy hand, and it typically comes from your show, and there's all sorts of draw, you know, like I, I find a lot of, I watch a lot of the clips, right? So I'm not a guy that sits there for eight hours and I'm gonna watch all totally. the games. But you know, when the big ones come out, I'll see some here and there, and they're always kind of interesting. You know, the Nipplegate thing, I, I, I'm sort of like indifferent to it. I don't really have like a strong opinion. Like I don't care. Yeah. It didn't offend me. Mm, you know, right. I think it was obviously a joke and jest. And, yeah. and actually, on that note, okay, we're gonna go down a slight tangent, but like the nipple thing. There's a, a group called Minuskin, and one of the one of the women in the group, she likes to just not wear a top like the guys do, right? And she lets her nipples flop, free the nipple. And I thought to myself, like in Toronto, <clears throat> you know, like you're allowed to walk around topless whether you're male or female. I didn't know that. And the idea that you can't is really kind of oppressive. Like, why is a man allowed to walk down the beach without a shirt on, but a man, a woman must cover her chest? Like, it doesn't make any sense, right? No. So both men and women have genitalia down low, right? We got nipples, they got nipples. Why right. are our nipples okay to show and theirs not, <laughs> right? So I'm like, I'm a free the nipple guy on yeah. that tangent for sure. But as far as like people being different or unique or trying to create a show or something like that, I'm all for it, for the character, for all that sort of sure, thing. Sure, sure. I don't think it's the meaning. I don't think it's problematic. I think it's just a joke. And if you can't take a joke, yeah, bro, take a chill pill. Yeah. Will you ever, and I know we've talked about this, and you have the life of Riley. You play in all your stuff out there in Vegas. you got your beautiful wife. You're kind of hunkered down. You don't travel. But will you ever play on Hustler Casino Live? Can we get a commitment out of you that at some point you will be in a seat? I'll put you in seat two so you can win. I'll tell you what's funny. <laughs> I'll tell you what's funny. I was like, ah, stream, stream. When I watched that streamer game that you guys had where Phil Helmuth was on there, with it, and I watched the, the pots and Mr. Beast, I'm like, holy fuck, I might have flew out for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, I mean, that's like the value you have in that game. I mean, that's a pretty juicy game. So yeah, I'm 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 open to it, right? Like for me, it's all about scheduling and timing. Totally. Whether I'm going to be in, because I don't like to travel, as you know, as I said. And LA is not much of a travel. My wife loves LA. She lived there for many years. So you know, if I'm planning on making a trip or something along those lines, or I've got something to do out there, I'll I'll get a hold of you and see if uh, you know we can make a show happen. It's a cherry patch, Daniel. That doesn't have to be a streamer game. You might want to just come once in a while, bring your beautiful wife to LA. And uh, have a seat, you know? You're, you're definitely welcome, and you are someone we would want on. So when you're ready, we'll do it. Okay, I'm working, though. Like, a couple <clears> things i got to get, and I've been trying to patent them, is, like, you know, sir, the anal beads that I have, they're really, <laughs> they're irritants. Like, yeah. they really irritate. So I'm wondering if I can get something that's a little softer, yeah. you know, made up when I do the show. When you, I mean, I want to make sure that the buzzing's on point. When you get, when you get, see, that's why I'm going to put you in seat two. So I'm going to put you in seat two. It has its own vibration in the seat. And we also provide seat two with comforting and very uh, nice fitting beads. So you're, you're good. We got you. We got you covered. We got you covered. And whoever you want to put them in is your call. Also, just in case there's any anal mm. cavity searches after, I want the dissolvable ones. <laughs> like, after six hours, you check and you're like, nope, no beads. <laughs> no no beads. beads. <laughs> It's okay. Booked. We we got the beads for you. We'll we'll have it. Uh, we'll have it. Um, I'm just for fun, and the only reason I'm asking this question is because it's an entertaining fucking topic to me. Um, I want to go on record to say before I preface, I want to preface the question. I have met Phil Helmuth a few times, and a handful of times or more. I really, really like him as a person. I think genuinely deep in his core, he's like one of the nicest people. If my read's wrong, it's wrong. Fine. I obviously understand because of the way he handles criticism and his bragging that he takes a ton of heat. But you have been very vocal about really going after Phil. I don't think you've went after him in a nasty way. I don't. This isn't like a setup question. Uh, but tell me your relationship with him and why is it like the way it is? And just anything you want to freelance on that. Okay, so mm. I like Phil. He's my favorite player to watch on TV still. I think he's hilarious. Yeah. I love watching him go off. Yeah. It's a blast. And there's a reason that their eyeballs on him. Right. I don't I think I agree with you that he's one of the nicest guys you'll find, right? Now, there's obviously sometimes when he goes off on a guy who's like an amateur or whatever. Yeah, it's not cool. Line, like, you know, that's I'm like, bro, just give this guy a break kind of thing. Yeah. But I think the biggest thing is this with Phil, right? I think Phil wants to be liked. He's a likable guy. Um, his I think 
his biggest beef with me is I tell the truth about my thoughts, right? Right. People ask me who I think the best player in the world is. I say Phil Ivey, right? And I tell you the reasons why. When Phil says he thinks he's the best in the world, I disagree. And I think as a result of that, he takes that as a slight. Meanwhile, what I'm saying is his World Series of poker record, it's the absolute, you know, like, it's the best. It's the best. He's done great at that. Yeah, you can't Meanwhile, refute it. I think it. that in today's environment, <clears throat> he's the best tournament player or the best at all. I don't think so. I think there's a lot of players that are better than him, you know? And uh, and so he takes issue with that because he does, you know, he, he obviously says these things. He wants that to be the public, you know, notion. And I've offered to put my money where my mouth is. I offered the guy two to one odds. He could play 50 high rollers at the Aria, 25K and above. Right? And I'll give him two to one odds. I'll put a 400K to his 200K. He said he would do it, agreed to do it, and then he didn't do it. Yeah. So, you know, that's the thing. It's like, I mean, I'm all about put your money where your mouth is. And it's not a slide. I don't think he's a bad poker player. I think he's, you know, very smart and good at what he does. I just think, as compared to some of the, like, really hardworking pros of today, you know, he has some, some tendencies that are very exploitable. He uses them to exploit others, but against some really, really good players, I think there's some things that he does that will make it difficult for him to succeed. You know, in, turn- in tournaments or cash? In cash? That's my opinion of the <clears throat> game, but like, that has nothing to do with him as a person. You know what I mean? I do think that like it was rich for him to, like when Eric Persons was giving him the fingers, for him to say, floor, floor, help me, please protect me. Ah, come on, bro. <laughs> you can't be the guy that dishes it out as often as you do at the table, <laughs> right. right? And be like, woe is me, because the guy gave you the finger. Right. right? That, you, if you're going to live in that arena where you talk a lot of shit, you got to be able to take the shit, too. That's all I was saying. Well, speaking of giving shit and taking shit, what do you think about uh, the guy that was passing out posted notes to Eric Person, and then he felted him, and then went on a, I don't know if you even saw it, went on an absolute rant, just destroying him, taking his chips from him. Do you, did you see that? I think I saw mm. that hand where like he threw the, yeah, the, with, the, with the post-it note, something yeah. like that, and he got the guy to bluff it off with, uh, when he had ace and ten, something like that. Yeah. And like, again, again, once you enter that arena, like, like for example, if I play with Phil Hellmuth at the table, I'll talk shit with him, right? But I'm not going to do that to Eric Sano. Right. Eric Sano doesn't, doesn't play that game. Right. right. But if you, you join in and you're like, all right, I'm a shit talker, okay, then all is fair in love and war. You know, you're fair game all of a sudden. So it seems like the guy that Eric, I mean, I didn't see the previous hands where this guy was doing that with the notes, but if he was, you know, giving people shit, <laughs> you give people shit. You got to be able to take it. It's that simple. Right. And, you know, it looks like Eric Person gave him plenty. Yeah, oh, he did. He did a good job. Yeah, he did a good job. Um, okay. Well, let's see here. The I, I think the, that all I have left is what is left for you? Is there anything left for you that you want to accomplish in your poker career? And then second question, what do you want to accomplish in your personal life, i.e. kids? I don't know how old your wife is. You said she's younger, 10 years, so she's 38, I would imagine. Um, what, what, what's what's your, your next phase of life and what you want to accomplish personally and professionally? Yeah, so with poker, you know, I've all, every year I usually come up with something and I usually sit down and sort of set some goals for the coming year in 2023 and I map out what I want to do. A big part of it's always going to be the World Series of Poker, you know, and, uh, you know, succeeding there. I, I feel like my World Series of Poker career has been really underwhelming with so many second place finishes and I have six braces. I feel like I should have 10 or 11 by now, yeah. you know, um, so that's been underwhelming. So I want to try to, you know, get back into that hunt a little bit. Um, uh, and, but yeah, like I, that's something that I'm going to think about in the next couple of weeks. Right now, I love the way I'm playing poker. I'm the best I've ever been by a long stretch. Um, so I feel like it's important to strike while the iron is hot and play. I might play some Tritons in 2023. We shall see. I'll start with the Poker Go Cup and go from there. As far as personal life goes, yeah. You know, the plan for us was to, you know, you know, have, you know, have children where I'm looking to adopt, also looking to potentially, you know, do a surrogate or something along those lines as well. Um, but during COVID, just felt like, you know, the timing wasn't right. Because, you know, everybody was hard to travel, it was hard to do everything. And that's when we sort of got married. But now that that seems to have come to, you know, like, well, in most parts of the world, it's totally fine. Um, you know, uh, that's what we'll start to look to do, you know? Yeah. And that will obviously change things for me as well, right? Because, yeah. you know, obviously most people who have children understand that, you know, you don't, you can't just... It's not just about you anymore, right? Correct. You've got to, uh, you, you know, you, you don't get to only worry about your phone stuff. But, but I feel like, you know, I'm at a stage where I'm ready for it, and I know that she is too. <clears throat> and then we've got some other things that I know she wanted to do around here in terms of some initiatives 
she's always had a soft spot for homeless people because she lived on, you know, lived near Skid Row in downtown LA. And if you've been down there, you know, she walks by every day and she's mm -hmm. making relationships with these people. And she's getting her psychology degree right now so that she can offer, you know, mental health um, help for those that need it. Like a lot of these people that are on the street, a vast majority of them, it's not just that they're like drug addicts, they're, they're actually suffering from some mental health issues that if they're <clears throat> medicated properly, could be rectified. Correct. So they could actually live some, some like, you know, somebody's bipolar and they're not medicated, they're not gonna be okay, right? But if they do get treatment, you know, they could be okay. So looking into that and also in town, there's a charity that she found or there's an organization here that works with um, homeless teenagers between the ages of 12 and 20, which is sick to say, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. 12 and 13 year old kids that are actually homeless wow, in so a country sad. as wealthy as we are here in the United States, um, you know, to not, you know, do a better job of taking care of that. So I guess we have to do that, you know, privately and, and those that, that have the means, you know, if everybody did their part, right? You know, like if everybody who has, let's say, $10 million, right? If you took 100K or 200K a year and you use that to help those people that are less fortunate, it affects your life. Guess what? Negative doesn't affect you at all. Like at all. You lose nothing. But you gain some satisfaction. You, 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 know, you gain what it feels like to be a giver, right? Which is valuable in itself. You get to make a difference in the world. And you get to take poker as a career and use that for some good because a lot of people say like what is poker it's a selfish endeavor right you just so, take your money from people right? yeah and it's true to a certain degree but you can choose what you do with that money right and you choose what sort of organizations you want to support and right stuff like that so, <clears throat> so that's like what the future looks like on a personal level from us and in poker you know that's always going to be there and i'll always find ways to, to motivate myself to yeah. compete at the highest level well one thing i want to say first of all you got a good one there so it's really cool what you just told me um no, no, no bullshit when I say this, uh, and I don't just mean money, but it's even time. If you and your wife actually pursue something like that out here, even as far as time and resources, include me. That's something that, that kind of resonates with me too, especially when you hit like the younger children that are in that position, because I have three children and I just have a huge soft spot for uh, uh, situations like that. I, I don't know if you know this, I used to be a cop, and the only yeah. thing that ever affected me was something that had to do with like children that was the only thing that really put me back on my heels so if you guys really start something and you do something and not just resources monetarily but actually time let me know yeah for I'd, sure. I'd like to I've be part of it idea, mm -hmm. i'm embarrassed to say i've had it for about a decade and i haven't actually implemented it yet and i want to and it's, just, it's almost somewhat of almost like a uh, almost like what you would consider like a scholarship program for homeless people but i would choose them Right. So mm -hmm. basically we would go in and what would, cause here's the thing, there's obviously everybody needs help, but there are some people that are going to be more, you know, some people will, you'll be able to have a, have a path towards recovery a lot cleaner than others. Right. So I would, you know, we would, we would choose families and stuff like that to sponsor. Mm -hmm. And then I would set them up with, first of all, we'd set them up with residents. Right. And then we would set them up literally with psychologists, therapists, nutritionists, um, you know, a recruiter, we'd get them in school if they needed it and give them like one and a half to two years mm -hmm. of a rehabilitation opportunity so that these kids who are seven and eight years old have big dreams can actually attain them because you know the truth. You know when you see these seven, eight-year-old kids that are homeless say, oh, I want to be this and that. You know what they're probably going to be. And let's just be real. Yeah. You know, when yeah. they're 16, 17, their prognosis is not very good. Well, you and, and you know this. So, yeah. And that, that, that starts, strikes accordingly because the kids didn't choose that. You know what I mean? And I'm not blaming those that are homeless either. I'm saying because some of them are, are there out of no fault of their own as well, right? Or, you know, just have it rough. And I feel like there's some value in, I don't know, maybe maybe it's not the most efficient way. And I know it falls in the face of like sort of out effective altruism, which is about doing the most good for the most bang. But I think I find more value in doing things that touch me personally. Same, like you said, you know, yeah, where like I can feel it. Where, where instead of just writing a check and be like, Here, okay, yeah, so we're gonna get malaria nets, which is great, <clears throat> it helps a lot of people in Africa. It doesn't give me the warm and fuzzies the same way seeing the evolution of a family who's destined for disaster and despair and actually flipping the script, you know, and just seeing them re rehabilitate. I don't know, well, those, I those sort of things, I agree, and and so let me just. Uh, let me just add to it. So yeah, I would want to help monetarily, but like you just said, more so um, with my time. So 
you know, it's really unfortunate because some of these kids, it's proven that like the first few years of your life, whatever nurturing or attention you get, it kind of real, it's sick, but it kind of builds who you are. So after a certain point, it's really a struggle to, to get to the heart of somebody or to change their trajectory or to make them, uh, whatever that is. So, but even with that said, uh, I would be interested if you really get to that point, even in giving the time to, uh, something that's always been like when I, when I organically bump into a situation like this, I lean into it. I would love to be able to spend time with those kids and be able to talk to them or mentor them or to give them encouragement or to whatever it is, as well as help monetarily, because I totally agree with you. Like you can, you can stroke a check. Fine. That's great. And it will help. But um, there is a satisfaction to seeing not only giving the help, but like seeing the change or seeing how it actually affected someone to plus EV in a situation like that. So no bullshit. This isn't for anything. This is this is like an organic conversation we just had. I totally would love if you wanted to discuss that further. Yeah, I wanted to share one thing too about that. You know, people talk about a selfless act. You know, what is a selfless act? And they don't exist actually. So right. the only selfless act, the only selfless act that exists is risking your or risking your life to save another life. Right. Right. Because then you're actually literally giving up life. But whenever you do something for someone else, right? You give, okay? You gain. You get something. And there's nothing wrong with this circle, okay? Yeah. By accepting and receiving love and gifts and all these things. Like, you know, there's nothing wrong with the idea. And in love, if you've never experienced this on your own, I highly recommend it. You know, whatever simple thing it is, is true happiness is born out of like giving to others. And whatever problems that you have in your own life or whatever despair or depressions you may have, get helping other people with air helps you focusing out rather than focusing in gives you at least a brief time away from your own stuff and you can escape and you can be filled with the feeling that you know you've done something good for somebody else. Okay. And if you think about that as a ripple effect, right? You do it, I do it, you do it for somebody else, you pay it forward and everybody else pays it forward. We all of a sudden create this positive ripple you know, yeah. change in people's lives rather than the unfortunate one we see on social media, which is too much ripping everybody apart and ripping them down and building them down rather than being good and positive. And listen, I'm guilty of being an asshole too sometimes. My rant, obviously, I'm going to look back at it because I'm sure it's going to be all over whatever with the, oh, look at this. This is who we really need. And they'll focus on that too. Yeah, right? they're, they're going to take one clip the without the context. We talked about other things of value for other people. But this just is this is just what people are. People are complicated, right? That's yeah. why, like, whatever you want to talk about politically, like, some people, you know, whatever, whether it's Elon Musk or whoever, like, I hate this guy, I love this guy. You know, people are complex. Sometimes people can be assholes and dickheads, but also offer a lot to humanity and yeah. society. It's not yeah. so black and white, right? Like, I I know that I offer a lot of good, and I have my moments too where I'm a dickhead and an asshole. I try to minimize those as much as possible, but I don't deny they exist. I don't pretend they don't exist. I don't live in an authentic world acting as though I'm holier than thou and have it all figured out. No, I lose my shit too. And so do you. And I hope you, you know, those that watch it know that it's okay. You yeah. Know, it's okay. As long as you're working towards doing less and being a better person each and every day, embrace the fact that you're not a perfect human being. Totally. Because if you have this obsession <clears throat> with being one, you're going to be constantly in disappointment because you'll never achieve this perfection that, that you know, that, that, that you're being sold on. Yeah, no bullshit. I, I could not agree more. Uh, we're a lot alike. Uh, that, I hope that you don't take that as a negative because of what you hear about me, but we really are. Anyways, you, you made me think, I think that's all great stuff, and, I, and, I, and that is a true, real offer if you want to discuss it. Um, one thing you made me think of was something you said back prior to this topic is you said, you know, I'm playing better than ever. I'm in like this, mate, this groove in poker, and sorry to, to redirect, but <clears throat> it made me think of it. You know, back if you go back in the day of like high stakes poker when all the OGs were on and, you know, you and Antonio and and Doyle and, you know, that, you know, tell me two things. One, how fun was that? And do you miss those days because they were so different? And then the second question is, it seems like you made it, I don't want to say out, but you've transitioned into today's poker with 
studying poker and getting coaching and playing differently and understanding the charts and doing things. So a lot of the old poker players we don't see anymore because they didn't they weren't able or didn't want to transition into the new poker because poker players are just 10x 20x better than they used to be and this is a whole different game so i guess it's a million questions in there tell me what you miss about that how cool it was or maybe it wasn't um anything that you can remember about it that's interesting for the listeners and again i've given you 30 things here so i apologize but it's just one run-on sentence thought for me and then how were you able and why were you able to and why were some of those other players not evolving <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah. So there's something about the old nostalgia. I kind of appreciated the old school player who had to quote, quote unquote, like figure it out on their own. Right. So the way in which you become good at poker was you had to figure things out on your own, which is a different skill set. Right. Today, you don't even have to have card sense or, or real sort of poker, you know, that, that sort of you know natural ability or creativity. If you're really good at studying. So imagine you're a university student who studied a subject. Right. You can, you can tap poker that way now, too, and you can become pretty, pretty good at it. So that's different. I, I do have a deep respect and admiration for the Doyle Brunsons of the world who did it on his own. Like, you know how he did simulations? He took a deck of cards, and he put ace-king on one and deuces on the other, and he ran out of board. And he's like, all right, ace-king won that one, deuces won that one, and he do it like 100 times. He's like, okay, I think deuces is a favorite. Right? right? And you think about what we have available to us now in comparison, right? Yeah. So there's something nostalgic about that. I appreciate it. You know, comparing the eras, I think people make a mistake. When they say all oh, these players are better today, yeah, they are better today, of course. But they have theoretical knowledge and theoretical ability to have this knowledge yeah. that we didn't have back then. They're better Take for a the reason. Today. <clears throat> yeah. Take the players of today, put them in 1997, okay? They have no solver. They have no charts, like you said. They just have to figure out how to play the game with very little information outside of that. Yeah. And you'll see that, like, you you know, Bobby Fischer said this. He was like, he was asked, like, were the chess players better today than they were in 1850? And he's like... They're different. They're totally different. You know what I mean? So you can't really compare them because, yeah. you know, the players of today, you imagine, oh, if they played them, if they played them back in that era, they wouldn't be as good either. Right. You know no, I mean? totally. Like, totally. Of course. So, so how was I able to sort of stay relevant and yeah. stay relevant? Well, I think the main thing is this. And I've told this story before, but I'll tell it one last time. I remember being in the World Series of Poker in 1998, and I was playing with like Brad Doherty and Tom McAvoy and some of the older generation guys, and, you know. I was 22 or 23 or something like that. And I was ferocious, aggressive, and they were like kind of weak. And I felt like they were all, I, I heard them sort of complain about the young kids and how aggressive they play and all that stuff. And I thought to myself, never be that guy. Yeah. Never be that guy who feels like you've got it all figured out and there's nothing left to learn, right? So I've always had a deep respect and admiration for the younger generation that works really hard and learns new stuff. And every six months, or maybe not every couple of years, I always like delve back in my game and go, okay, what am I doing that I can do better? And who am I going to learn from? I'm not going to learn from my era. I'm going to learn from the younger generation, try to understand game theory on a deeper level and all this stuff, and then combine the theoretical knowledge of what's available today with 30 years of wisdom, of understanding the, how humans misapply game theory information. So mm -hmm. that's the thing. That's, the, that's a big key. Everyone talks about GTO, play GTO. Nobody, this is what, nobody in the world plays GTO. Nobody. It is impossible no human being can ever do it. Yes, right? not attainable. So, as a result, what we have is human beings trying to mimic solver outputs. But we don't do that perfectly, and we never will. So that's always going to leave room for someone like me, who's an exploitative player, who can say, okay, I know what the theory they're studying is. I know the flaws, and I can see the escape valves in where they're mistaken. One perfect simple example is 100 big blinds deep using a limp strategy in spot. They cannot study this. They don't know what to do with this stuff. It more yeah. It's true. Right? I know. When I'm limping middle position or later under the gun, it breaks the solver because what happens is, is now in these limp pots, you have infinite ranges from the big blind and small because the big blind could have anything, small blind could have anything. And now you're playing a three, four way pot. So your solver doesn't give you the clear outputs and stuff like that. So what you have to rely on, card sense and experience, and I've got 30 years of that. Right. So I'm going to play to my strengths, and I always feel like poker will offer opportunities. But the most important thing for me to understand, first and foremost, was learn the theory. If I don't learn the theory and I don't learn the misapplication of it, then I can't exploit it. 
Effectively. That's actually really brilliant. So basically, in a nutshell, it's counterintelligence. What you're saying is, you know the theory, you study the theory, you know the intelligence, but you're going to go ahead and not do what the solver says to fuck up their ability to understand what you're doing. So you're just counter, you're countering the GTO. And if you were to do what you're supposed to do GTO wise, then it's very easy for them. But when you're not, because you understand, uh, you understand the intelligence on the other end, then you can exploit it. It's, 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 you know, one it's guy, brilliant. One guy who really woke me up to that just by watching him play was Michael Adamo, okay? So if you watch these high stakes tournaments, Michael Adamo was playing a different game than everybody else. He's using different sizes huge overbet sizes, doing all kinds of things that were unconventional, mm -hmm. right? And he dominated for, you know, a good period there. People had no idea how to, how to defend against it and play against it, right? So I thought to myself, well, can I do that in a different way? And I said, yeah, I think I can, you know? I'm not going to necessarily out-theory people, right? I'm not going to out-GTO people. But what I can do is I can use my card sense, I can use my post-flop reading ability, I can create sizes that work for me in a balanced way that make it more difficult for them. So, cause here's, for those that don't know how solvers work, I'll give you a brief thing and understand. Typically what these people do is they'll see a hand and be like, all right, they give the computer three choices. Say, bet one third pot, bet two thirds pot, or bet one and a half times pot, for example. Then you ask the computer the question, right? And the computer gives you the answer based on the question that you asked, right? But the question you asked didn't include limping, didn't include 80%, it didn't include 22%, it didn't include a lot of different things that a solver may do. Right. Because it you, you because you can't really do solves that way. So it limits, you know, what you're what you're what you're getting out of it. So anytime you can play in such a way that's unconventional, that that fucks against what everybody studies and puts them in spots that they don't know the answers to, and you're comfortable in that, that gives you the advantage. Man, makes a ton of sense. Uh, I don't know why I'm asking you this. Maybe it's an uninteresting question, but you wound up, I think, getting coached for your heads up play by MJ. Yeah, is that correct? And how did what was Matt? Matt was the Matt Boyd and MJ uh, as well. Matt Boyd is the one who was doing all the solves and stuff like that, and, and you know teaching me the how to use the. Uh, like, how the did that did that benefit you a ton? And and how did you pick those guys? Well, that's how I learned theory. So they approached me years before, you know, and I worked with them uh, before on just understanding game theory because I was such a fish out of water. I never, I didn't even know how to turn the computer on to do it and all this sort of stuff. So they helped explain it to me and evolve and really like, like I said, you know, I always try to update my my game and understand what the young kids are doing. And they were like a good team in terms of being able to sort of work with me on understanding. And I remember the first 30, 40 minutes we started and I didn't, I was intimidated and I felt like I can't do this. Yeah, I you got frustrated. It, couldn't work it. Um, but then it started to click and I started to understand what the solver wanted. And then I've sort of, I've taken what I learned from all that and extrapolated that and combined that with, as I said, the 30 years of experience. Yeah. And um, created a, a game that ha pays respect to game theory, if you will, mm -hmm. an understanding of it. But I'm not randomizing like based on a num my watch. Oh, well, look at that. The watch said seven. I guess I gotta go all in. No, I'm not doing that. That's I get inferior it. Inferior in live tournaments, especially. Yeah. yeah. That's not the optimal way to do it. The optimal way to randomize is to randomize based on your opponent, right? Mm -hmm. So if your opponent thinks you bluff a lot, don't bluff. If your opponent <laughs> thinks you never bluff, <clears throat> bluff him more. Right. That's how you randomize. Sure. Not by looking at a watch. Totally. Wow, it's so interesting. I mean, we could we could go down a million rabbit holes, uh, but I get it. And I, I think this is my last question, unless we come up with something that strikes something, because I kept you for a while here. So I'm going to I'm promise you, I think this is it. And then I'm going to ask you for your closing thoughts. Uh, my question to you is, and this is just really fun for me to know, and hopefully for someone else, who, when you played back in the day at high stakes poker with all the legends, who is your favorite people to play with and why? And who you fucking can't stand when you were playing them back then, if you're willing to say? Yeah, I mean, obviously, like, I enjoy playing, like I said, Phil Hellmuth because he's, <clears throat> you know, he's just fun for TV and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I also found that when I played with John Juwand and Phil Ivey, who were friends of mine as well, like, it brought up my A game. Because I knew with Juwand, he was watching everything pre-flop. And Phil, I was watching everything all the time, so I knew I couldn't be all loosey goosey eating a sandwich when they were. <laughs> there's the, the there's the famous quote. The chess match because yeah. 
like it, it became like a leveling war because we talked so much strategy that you know it's like he knows that I know that he knows I know he knows this so where, which way am I going am I going left or am I going right yeah as far as people I didn't like playing with um I, I mean I, it's really hard to think of if, if you don't have anyone I, really, I guess I just never really like playing with slow players yeah they really weren't that prevalent back then yeah you know what I mean um, How do you feel about sitting at a table of full euros now when everything's 15 minutes to make a decision, no matter what you're playing? Well, they don't do that one. They can't do that when I'm at the table because I'll use, you know, I'm either, I'm typically playing in shot clock tournaments anyway. Mm. And if I'm not, if I wasn't, I, I'm not, I'm not weak willed and too afraid to call the clock. I'm not like, oh, what? If, they might not like me if I call the clock. I, yeah. don't, I don't care. It's not personal, bro. Yeah. It's not personal. Yeah, let's go. I tell people, I usually give them grace. So I, this is how I work with the clock. If somebody normally acts very quickly, let's say you're making your session really quickly, right? But then on the river, you, you need like three, four minutes, five minutes. I'm going to respect it. Yeah, that's different. That that's different. Because you're not <clears throat> being egregious and wasting time. Yeah. If you're a guy who takes 45 seconds to look at his cards, the seven do soft, right? And you're on the river and you need your time, you don't get it from me. I get it. Right? Yeah. I also give people, typically I give people one one honorary, honorary tank where it's like I'll give you as much as you need and then I tell them, listen, just, just so you know, like on the next one, I'm going to call a clock around two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's fair. I get it. Yeah. So I, wait, I let them know ahead of time. And it isn't personal, you know? Like I was, I, it, it's never personal. I mean, it isn't. I'm not like, fuck this guy, I'm calling the clock. It's just a question of like, this is within our rules, guys. We should use it. Yeah. If it's in your best interest that hands don't take 15 minutes and you want to play more hands, then take that into your own hands, you know? And yeah. Like, you all know what a reasonable amount of time is. And obviously... The spot matters, the situation matters, the pot size matters. Like if a guy bets, you know, three chips on the river and they both have 500 chips and he takes three minutes, get the fuck out of here, right? Totally. But if it's like for your turn in life and it's a big spot, yeah, of course. You're yeah. going to give a little bit more leeway. Way different. You know, overall, I, you know, shot clocks are the way to go anyways. Yeah, totally. Okay, last but not least, because I've kept you long enough, uh, and if you don't have it, that's fine, but any Thing you want to say? Any closing thoughts? Anything you want to leave anyone with, or maybe not? I yeah, know. I think just in general, poker community, like just be like, I, I, I want you to delve into your authenticity. Okay, don't worry so much about being perfect because you're not going to be. Yeah. You know, and also I think when you when you're looking at people and you're looking at things that they do or they say, think of intent first and foremost. Yeah. Right. And understand that humans are complex. Right. I, there are very few people in the world that are pure evil or pure good, right? I don't even know if they exist in theory, but understanding that people are going to have good days and bad days and making a judgment about somebody based on one comment, or even like in your case, when you were on Twitter and you were getting in the weeds and you were being a little bit of a dickhead sometimes too. Yeah. You know, you're like, fuck with people. It's like, yeah. all right, you're human too and you have your threshold and you know it surpassed it and you you look back on it and you're like, all right, I shouldn't have done that. Fine, right? I think being um, understanding of the fact that we're all different yeah you see the world differently and you know if somebody has different ideological views than you in some ways that doesn't mean that you need to hate them right like i mean i don't i don't hate elon musk i know my people tell me i'm supposed to i'm supposed to hate this man but i don't hate him i drive a tesla it's a fucking great car okay <laughs> yeah I, it's the best car ever i just got a brand new one <laughs> i i appreciate a lot of the positive things he's done but i also you know what i acknowledge and on Twitter, sometimes he says shit, and he's an absolute dickhead and yep. an asshole, right? Right, right? So I can look at people and understand the complexities of them, whether I agree with them on everything or not. And I wish that, you know, within the poker community, we didn't see things as so black and white. And even if you think, like, for example, in the Robbie case, you disagree on that. That's okay. I don't have to hate you for it. Right. You know, I have different opinions. Uh, you know, such is life. Well, I'm going to say this in closing. Uh, number one. I probably have enjoyed this interview more than anyone I've done. I, I, I respect the shit out of your professional career. And now that I've gotten to know you a little bit better, I, I really like you. Um, wouldn't, I would just avoid that and not say it if it wasn't true. Uh, something you may know or may not know, we are on, from what I've seen, polar opposites politically. But I'm glad you said that. I don't want to talk about it. I bet we're not. I bet we're not. Well, uh, maybe not. Okay, well, we'll talk about it off, off, off stream. But... I thought we were, and maybe about a particular subject, but regardless, the thing I loved you said the most is, and I and I live by this, I don't care what your political beliefs are, I don't care what your ideologies are, I may not agree with them, I may cock my head and like go, how is that possible in my head, but 
just the pure fact that you said doesn't mean I have to hate you. I'm that way too. I don't care if you're left, right, feminist, this, much, whatever. Like you have the right to be. I probably wouldn't agree with a lot of it, but uh, I, I am totally of of the thinking of I can get along and like someone no matter what they think. So I want to just say I loved what you had to say here on the podcast. It was interesting as fuck, and you are always welcome to come play our show you'll have a seat anytime i would love to have you um and let's talk more about that stuff we talked about off offline and and uh we'll go from there all right my man sounds good it was a pleasure all right well this is the nick fertucci show i am nick fertucci we are here with the legend daniel negrano and envy out